For almost two years now, Americans have been struggling with much higher than normal inflation. And since that time, we have heard the Federal Reserve first say, we're not going to get any inflation. And then when it came, they said, yeah, but it's transitory. It's going to go away. And then when it didn't, they said, OK, we're going to start fighting it now. And they're still fighting it. They've been raising interest rates ever since then, going up by 25 basis points, 50 basis points, 75 basis points. And now on Tuesday, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell just said, looks like our fight has still not been effective. So instead of raising by a quarter of a percent like we did last time, we're going to go back up to a half a percent. This begs the question, do interest rate hikes actually do anything? Does that work to stop inflation? To answer this question, we need to understand something about how prices work and what prices do to an economy. So we're going to look at three scenarios of different types of economies. Number one, we're going to look at a completely free market and how prices work. Number two, we're going to look at a somewhat top-down controlled economy. And then number three, we're going to look at a totalitarian, full top-down control of an entire economy. All right, so imagine with me, we have a free market where there is no regulation, there are no laws, there are just people cooperating and competing with each other in commerce. For this completely free economy, we're going to use a deserted island where some boat crashes on the island. There's a hundred people that get deserted there and each one of these people just happens to have some different skills Some people are very good at climbing and so they take it upon themselves to collect coconuts from the top of trees Some of these people are very good at fishing And so they take it upon themselves to go out into the ocean and fish and get food that way Some people are good at building things. So they start making tools They start chopping down trees using branches and leaves and constructing huts for people to live in. Everybody has different skills. Some people don't have some of those skills, and so maybe they go and they participate with other people to learn from them, but ultimately, everybody is working to try and survive. Now, in this isolated local free economy, you are going to notice that some things are gonna be more valuable than others. For instance, the coconuts and the fish are probably going to be extremely valuable because if you can't get liquid to drink, or food to eat, you're gonna die. And so the people that have the ability to collect those things are probably going to be able to get what they want from others. For instance, if I can go get coconuts, I'm gonna climb to the top of the tree, I'm gonna collect some coconuts, and I'm gonna have a little bit of food and a little bit of liquid to be able to survive to the next day. But the guy who can build me a hut doesn't have any coconuts. So I can go to him and I can say, hey, look, I know that you'll die if you don't get some coconuts, but you can't climb this tree. I can't build a hut myself, so would you please build me a hut and I will give you three coconuts every day for the next 20 days until my hut is complete. You think that's a great deal because you know how to build a hut and otherwise you die by not being able to drink water from coconuts. So we happily agree. And at this point, the price of a hut is 20 coconuts and the price of 20 coconuts is one hut or the price of one coconut is 1 20th of a hut. Now, pretty soon I might get tired of eating coconuts. And so I go to the people who are collecting fish and I say, hey, I know that you're not starving here, but you must be pretty thirsty. So would you like to trade some coconuts for fish? And you say, sure. You say, you know, we'll do a, a one for one trade or a two for one trade. I give you two coconuts. You give me one fish. That way I get some more substantial food with more protein and fat and you get some liquid. So again, you don't die. So now the price of one fish is two coconuts and the price of a coconut is a half a fish. Now, the guy who can catch fish, he goes to the guy who can make huts and says, hey, would you make me a hut? And the guy says, you know what? Um, I'm a vegan. I don't eat fish. I only eat coconuts. So if you want to somehow collect coconuts for me, then I'll build you a hut. But I don't want any fish from you. So now the guy who fishes has to go fish extra and has to trade the fish for the coconut just to give the coconut to the guy who can build the huts so that he can get a hut built for himself. And this is the reason why barter has never existed as a monetary system throughout history, because it just doesn't work once you scale past two or 
or three people. As soon as you get more wants in place, you just have too many levels that people would have to barter and trade through for any sophisticated commerce to be able to happen. So what ends up happening, even on this island with just maybe a hundred people, the coconut might become the money because there's enough people that want the coconut that other people go get coconuts just so they can use it to get what they want. And because now they're willing to accept coconuts to go get what they want, suddenly it becomes money. It is a winner take all game. What does this have to do with interest rates? Don't worry, I'm getting there. Imagine now for a second that coconuts become extremely abundant. There was just a big rainy season and coconuts just start sprouting by the thousands and they're falling off the trees and suddenly nobody needs me to go get them coconuts anymore. So they can just pick them up for themselves off the ground or they can go to somebody else that knows how to climb trees and they can get a lot more coconuts, maybe 100 coconuts for a hut instead of 20 coconuts for a hut. So the supply of coconuts increasing means the value of those coconut coconuts relative to everything else goes down. And this is an example of what a price is. A price is just information about the relative scarcity or abundance of one item versus everything else. Now in our example, coconuts are the money. So let's say the coconut supply stays the same and the fish suddenly get very scarce. The fish get very scarce, suddenly people don't have enough to eat. And so they're scrambling to do anything they can to get fish. Maybe they're building more houses to get more coconuts to be the ones to be able to buy the fish. So the people in this scenario who can fish are able to demand a much higher price for the fish because they're a lot more scarce. The price goes up because this, the quantity, the supply goes down. And in a completely free and unregulated market, this is the only thing that prices do. Prices simply communicate information to all economic actors, people like you and me, about how scarce or abundant that thing is relative to everything else. And then people like you and me will make decisions about how valuable that thing is to us based on our own subjective wants, and that's in an ordinal list. Meaning, when you go and buy a cheeseburger, you don't think that cheeseburger is objectively more valuable than your $5. If you did, you would buy all the cheeseburgers because they would be more valuable than all your dollars. But only one cheeseburger is worth more than $5. At that point, you're full and you'd rather keep the next $5 than have another cheeseburger. For another example, let's talk about the relationship between you and your employer. Let's say there's no overtime available. That means that your labor is not objective worth, let's say $30 per hour. Otherwise, they would be spending $29 an hour as many hours as they could possibly get from you. But it's not objectively that valuable. Only those eight hours per day or 40 hours per week are valuable enough to them to give you $29 per hour. Past that, they're not getting enough of a return on their investment. And that's the same reason why you stop buying cheeseburgers after the first one or maybe the second one. That next one is not more worth it to you. And so with every individual actor in the economy being able to make decisions about exactly what they want in what order they want and being able to allocate their scarce resources in the way they feel is best for them, it allows everybody the ability for maximal profit, meaning getting the maximum value out of all exchanges. An exchange only happens when both parties are better off as a result of that exchange. One party would not voluntarily agree to an exchange if it would make them worse off. I'm not going to give you the coconuts for a house if I already have a house. Maybe I'd rather just have more coconuts. So in a completely free market, an exchange only happens if both parties are better off. This means that the price is pure signal about how scarce or abundant any item is relative to everything else, considering everybody's acting out of pure profit, purely looking for maximizing their own gain in whatever way they define that. That means prices are reliable because if you see a price, you know that that means that that item is worth that to everybody else. And so if you buy that item, you're saying that item is worth more to me than that price, than the dollars that I have to give up to get that. 
The $2,000 that you spend on rent are worth less to you than having a roof over your head. And so prices are the only thing that allow individuals to make economic decisions that are accurate, that allow them to predict the future and allow them to improve their lives. Without prices, there would be no way to objectively rank all of the items in the world and know whether or not you are making a decision that's gonna make you better off. You might have to just store up on some rice or store up on some coconuts and just hope that somebody else later on wants coconuts. But since there's a price associated with everything that again is determined by the large scale auction of all things by all people, that is information to you that you can make about whether or not that item is more valuable than the dollars you'll have to give up. But sadly, we don't live in a free market. We live in scenario number two, which is a partly controlled from the top down economy. And the part that is controlled is the money. Because money has a price as well, this is called the interest rate. This is the cost of acquiring more dollars. And so when you take out debt, there's different types of debt, money being used for different things, there's going to be a cost associated with that. How expensive is it to get your hands on money? So in a free market, if you're gonna be borrowing money, then the price associated with that money is going to tell you whether or not the money is abundant or scarce. Because if everybody has a ton of savings, then the interest rate will be low because all the savers will be wanting to make money on their money. So they'll be competing with each other to lend it to you. That means the interest rate will be bid lower. The savings pool is large, so the signal is go spend it. It's abundant, take risks, take out debt, and try and grow because there's a big cushion to fall back on. But if the savings pool is very small, that means there are not a lot of savers. That means everybody needs money. That means the interest rate is high because if somebody does have money, a lot of borrowers are competing with them to get their hands on that money so you can charge a high interest rate. The incentive then is don't spend. Save, try and become somebody who has saved so you can lend out because there's a profit incentive there. And so the price signal of money built into the system has a naturally equilibrium point at which people will start to save or start to spend, start to borrow or start to lend that keeps prices at a general healthy point. But the price of money is not today controlled by the free market, it is controlled by a few people at the Federal Reserve. And so when the Federal Reserve changes interest rates from the top down by their own decisions, instead of letting the market set the interest rate for itself, based on all the individuals interacting with each other, the massive scaled up auction of all individual wants and needs interacting with each other, determining the free market price of money. No, they impose that price of money from the top down. This still though sends a signal to economic actors about the abundance or the scarcity of money. When the dot-com bubble burst and the market started to crash, Greenspan lowered interest rates. That told people to borrow money and spend. But what did that do? It was a false signal being sent to the market, so it caused overinvestment and overspending this time in the housing market causing a new bubble. And then when that started to unwind and that started to crash, they lowered interest rates yet again, stimulating and building the, the groundwork and the foundation for a larger buildup of debt that culminated in 2020. We all know what happened in 2020 when things started to fall again, they lowered interest rates to zero again to try and stimulate yet even more spending. The savings pool has already been wiped out, but they're still trying to stimulate more spending. And this time they way overdid it through a bunch of money printing as well, increasing that supply, causing people to try and spend money, this time spilling over into a massive record-breaking inflationary period. And now they're trying to do the opposite. They're trying to send the signal to the free market or the somewhat free market that money is scarce. They're trying to jack interest rates up so that people save, so that they stop spending, so that businesses stop spending and key thing here, stop hiring. Which means that it's almost certain when you're 
from the top-down perspective, trying to control a price of something, whether it's the price of anything, whether it's gas, healthcare, food, or money, you're not going to be setting the price at what the market would be setting it at. Otherwise, you would just let the market set that price. There is no imposed control. So when you are controlling the interest rate, the price of money, it's going to be other than what the market would have already set it at left alone. Which means that right now, interest rates are either below what the market would set them at or above what the market would set them at. And as the Federal Reserve is dead set on stopping inflation, it is almost certain that they will over tighten because they'll keep on ratcheting up interest rates until we get to the point where they start to see inflation come down. And the longer that takes, the higher the likelihood is that they get interest rates past the point that the market would be setting them at by itself. Which brings us to scenario number three, because in the fallout of this crash, this next crash, when they over tighten and we start to see unemployment and we start to see the market crash even more and we start to see economic pain, people are gonna start begging for another bailout. And the Federal Reserve will look at everybody and will say, we tried that once and it caused inflation, but not because we did it wrong. We, we didn't print trillions of dollars and cause inflation. You caused the inflation because you went out and you hoarded toilet paper. You went out and you bought too much gas. You went out and you bought cryptos and NFTs and caused bubbles and contributed to frauds and scams and lost the money that we gave you. So we'll bail you out, but this time we need more control to save you from yourself. And in this scenario number three, at the point of maximum economic pain, they'll roll out a central bank digital currency, which is economic control of everything. It is the totalitarian control of the entire economy it is a tyrant's wet dream. Because with programmable digital money, you get to control the flow of all resources because any resource flows from one place to the next through a transaction of which money is one half. So if you can control the money, you can control one side of every transaction, you can control everything that happens in an economy. Too many people are buying gas, you put an instant ration in, you can't spend more than $400 at a gas station. People are hoarding toilet paper, bam, you can't buy more than too much toilet paper. Some businesses are going under, bam, here's a hundred bucks that everybody can spend only at these types of stores this month only or that money expires. And keep in mind, what this control does is it causes behavior to happen that is different than what those people would be doing without that control in place. And remember how people make economic decisions. They make decisions based on, given my scarce resources, what do I want to do that will give me the maximum potential benefit? You buy 10 cheeseburgers because those 10 cheeseburgers make you better off, or so you think maybe, than the money would otherwise. So the Federal Reserve comes in and says there's a shortage of cheeseburgers. People are rationed to five cheeseburgers at a time. Well, suddenly, they didn't realize why you were buying 10 of them. Maybe you were feeding your family. So do you think that one group of a few dozen people who have never worked a real job in their lives outside of academics and the Federal Reserve could ever make decisions that control the lives of every single economic actor in a way that more benefits everybody than each person being able to make every decision in a way that benefits themselves in their subjective ranking of value all throughout the day? Absolutely not because their changes in behavior that are imposed on you through the use of a CBDC are by definition changes in your behavior that make you do something other than what you would have done that would have made you better off. And so the moral of the story is in a completely free market, interest rates absolutely do control inflation and deflation. There's a natural equilibrium set in place that interest rates influence they are the price of money, so they influence what people do as saving and borrowing and spending and lending. And as you move from a free market completely to a controlled market completely, you lose the effectiveness of those signals and you cause more and more problems until you get to the end, which is just complete collapse.
And that is why I always say that a central bank digital currency is the line that none of us should ever cross, regardless of the costs. Thank you so much for watching. If you're still hanging on, I'm able to make videos like this because people like you who want to protect yourself from crazy circumstances like this, want to better yourself, get financial education, learn how to invest and trade. And that's exactly what I do with Heresy Financial University members. Link is in the description below. As always, really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.